Romans chapter 15. You know, last week we were in Houston and we were at that mission conference and uh, Brother Brent Logan was the guest speaker. Now, some of you will remember that Brent Logan preached for us in uh, 2018 and 2019, just before COVID. Of course, when COVID hit, he couldn't come across the border. Um, so um, I would really, really encourage you. Uh, maybe you want to write this down and if you if you maybe you'll need to ask me after the service but if you go to Shady Acres Baptist Church Houston if you look that up online that'll bring you to their website and that'll bring you to the services um, the service Wednesday night each each night he was preaching through the book of Jonah and he was making a missions emphasis and it was really it was excellent but on the Wednesday night, he preached on chapter three and um, he would try to isolate a hero out of each chapter. And he said, the hero in Jonah chapter three is the king of Nineveh. Because he said, Jonah in chapter three, he does finally land on dry ground and start to preach the message. But his message is eight words and it's, it's the message God gave him. But that's all he told the people. And it was, you know, pretty dark, you know. 40 days and you're going to be overthrown. But he said, but when the king of Nineveh hears that message, he literally gives several verses and he tells the people, we need to fast, we need to pray. And he tells them all these things to do. And of course, he is a lost Gentile. And um, and you come to the end of the of that chapter and the king of Nineveh says, who can tell if just maybe God will have mercy? And that was really the theme of the message was who can tell if you if you can watch any messages from from last week there online. If you will watch Wednesday night, it was outstanding. And um, my wife and I were talking about it and. Um, it was it was such a message on, um, you know, what God can do, you know, um, it seemed that it was decreed, and indeed it was, that um, Nineveh would be destroyed. God wasn't playing games. God was serious, and God had decreed their destruction. And yet, when they repented, um, and that they had no guarantee that God would do anything, but the king said, who can tell? Just, just maybe God will change his mind. And, of course, you guys know the story. He did change his mind. Um, I thought, what a message for those who seem glad. And they are glad to resign themselves to the worst case scenario. We have a lot of Christians that honestly, I think they're really hoping that everything goes south in a really big way. They're, they're really hoping that that we, we lose all our freedoms and, and, you know, we have to run for the hills and defend ourselves with our stash of ammo and, you um, and, um, and, you know, cause every time with some of these people, some of these Christians, every time you try to say something encouraging, every time you try to say, well, you know, you know, I think God will do this. They immediately come back with, with, um, and, and it is church. We've got a few of invariably. They're going to look at me and they're say, no, pastor, I, I think the worst is yet to come and it's really going to be bad. And we're, and, you know, and, and they just. And they, they, they really, they really think that I'm just naive or something, I guess. And there's a lot of those people that they're actually going to be mad if it doesn't go bad <laughs> because it's going to make them look stupid. And um, yeah, sure. The Lord's coming and it's all, it's all, it's all, you know, we, we understand all that perilous times shall come. And by the way, they've already come. Um, but um but there is an interesting verse in uh, Second Thessalonians, and it says only, and it's talking about the context of the second coming of Jesus Christ. It says, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. The word let 
in the old English, it means to hinder. And you see it used. Paul used that word. He said, oft and again, I would have come to you, but I was let hitherto. In other words, there was something that blocked my way. And right now, as we approach the second coming of Jesus Christ, there is something that has kept this whole madhouse from going crazy. And that is, there is something in the spiritual realm that lets, that hinders. And it is the Lord himself. And he's, he's holding it all back. And he did tell us to pray that we might he did tell us to pray that we might lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty because it is he who has his hand on the throttle. It is he, you know, the devil wants to wipe out Job in the book of Job. And you know what the devil had to do? He had to go to God first. And God said, okay, you can go this far and no further. Guess what hindered Satan's work? The Lord himself. The Lord himself. So as I thought about those things, it made me think of this verse. And so we're going to look at this tonight. Revelation, I'm sorry, Romans 15. Romans 15, verse 13. What it made me think of is I was thinking about Brother brother Logan's message. And, and it really, it built to a crescendo. And, you know, and in that room that night, and, and he kept saying, you know, who can tell what God might do? And and it was such a message of hope. You know, one of the things the devil wants to rob Christians of is their hope. And when you lose your hope, you lose your brightness. Um, you lose your anticipation. Um, so um, God is all about hope. You know how Paul describes the Gentiles? It says they are without God and without hope. Now, what's sad is when you get Christians without hope. And uh, the devil's done a pretty good job of, of really pushing a lot of Christians to that zone, and they think it's spiritual. So let's, let's read Romans 15, verse 13. Now, the God of resignation fill you. Wait a minute. I misread that again. A lot of Christians, they're just resigned to their fate. God never intended you to live that way. Period. That's why he told you to pray. Either prayer changes things or it is a waste of time. That's what it comes down to. Romans 15, verse 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. He is the God of hope. And he says, now the God of hope Feel you. You know, there, there's several places in the Bible where it talks about how God works with his people. And God wants his people full. You go back into the Old Testament and he tells the Jews, he says, I'm going to take you into that, that Canaan land. And he says, I'm going to give you houses full of good things. In Job 22, it describes the time before the flood. And it says, even about the lost world, it says God had filled their houses with good things. In Deuteronomy 8 and Deuteronomy 11, repeatedly you see God telling the Jews, I'm going to make it to where your, your life is full. Your life is full. Your life is full. Ruth chapter 2, Boaz looks at Ruth and he blesses her for leaving her homeland. And he says, May God give you a full reward. You know, the Lord never wastes words. He could, have, he could have just said, now the Lord reward thee. And that would have been good. But he said, no. He said, I, he said, may God just, may it be full to the brim. Full. In Acts chapter 2, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Filled. In Ephesians 3, Paul prays for the Ephesians that they would be filled with all the fullness of God. That's quite a mouthful when you examine what he said there. Now, in our verse, it says, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy. That word all, man, the Lord uses that word a lot. And it means, it means just in every direction, in every way you can think of, 
He could have just said, the Lord, fill you with joy. That, that would have been good. That would be a lot. But, but the Holy Ghost, our Lord is big on adjectives. And he says, the, he says, the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. And the verse says there, how does he do that? Verse 13, now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. In believing. You are filled with this in a certain place. When, you, when you're located in a certain place spiritually. You're filled when you are believing. And believing, the rest of the verse, causes you to another big word. To abound in hope. Abounding in what? Hope. Abounding in hope. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Believing, believing what? So I'm going to give you the reference. We're not, we're not going to turn to this one because we're going to turn to several in the next few minutes. But in Acts 24, 14, Paul is making his defense before one of the leaders. And he says, he says, I confess that yes, the way I worship my, 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 my relatives and my, my Jewish brethren, they call it heresy. And he says, but here's my heresy. He says, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. When he said in the law and the prophets, that was the scripture that, that, he, that they had in their hands right then. That was like saying, I, I believe everything that's in the Bible. Believing. The God of hope. Fill you with all joy and peace in believing. So I want to talk to you about, man, we could we could go for a long time tonight. We could, And I'm sure you could expand on the list I'm going to give you tonight. But I want to give you a few things that um, that will help you. Um, God wants you to have hope. God, God doesn't want you to look out on tomorrow and next week and next month and next year with dread and despair and this dark. Uh, he's The Lord is not interested in that. He is the God of hope. And he says, I will fill you with joy. I will fill you. I mean, to the brim with joy and peace in believing. So I want to give you a few things that if you believe them, if you believe them, it'll, it'll help you in that direction. Um, look with me at Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. You know, all, I don't know, maybe you're not this way, but I think for a lot of people, and especially in the world we live in, it's very easy to just automatically think negatively because everywhere you look, it just seems like there's something negative hitting you. And um, and that's not even, you know, even sometimes your personal circumstances and, and you know, difficulties going on in your families and all that. It's it's very um, it's very easy to be very negative. When, when David gets caught at... at at Ziklag, David has been living in the land of the Philistines, I think, for just over a year. And uh, he's been fleeing from Saul. He's been on the run. David was on the run for several years. Can you imagine? Uh, you, that'd, be, that'd be a hard place to keep your hope up. And yet, and yet we know the rest of the story. What was looming in front of David was the entire kingdom of Israel. He was going to be the king for the next 40 years. Great days were coming. But David is in a low place. When he gets to Ziklag and he and he grabs his 600 men and they they wade off to a battle and they they leave their 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 wives and their children. So these 600 men, their wives, their children, you know, their livestock and, uh, you know, the, the young men that were too young to fight. They're, they're all back there. So David and his men, they're all and, you know, surely David thought they were safe there. So they go, but while David goes, the Amalekites come in and the Amalekites take Ziklag. By the mercy of God, they didn't kill anyone, but they carried all the women, all the children, everything off. And then they burned that place with fire. Everything that everything they had erected, their tents, everything, they burned it down. 
So I think it was about three days later, David comes back and he finds Ziklag decimated. I mean, it's just ashes. And, and you know, those days were brutal. And that part of the world is brutal if you haven't noticed to the present day. You know, human life was cheap. And you know what David and his men assume? That their families have probably been killed or at least severely abused. And it says all the men began to weep. And these were, these were tough dudes. And then for the first time and probably the only time on record, David's men spake of stoning him. They figured they had followed David far enough. But it said, David encouraged himself. And the Lord is God. David looked back. David remembered back as a shepherd boy how the, the oil of anointing had been poured on him by Samuel. He remembered the victory with Goliath. He starts taking a walk down memory lane. He looks how God has delivered him time. And now his men are weeping and his men can't see all that. All they see in front of them is the negative. But David, by an act of his will, he takes a journey back to all the places where God has helped him. And he says, there's hope yet. And he goes to God and says, God, what do we do? And God says, go after him. And God says, David, you will recover all. And he did. And he did. Sometimes you, you have to purpose. Purpose. It, it, it's not a natural thing for most of us. Now, if you're young and bright and super positive, maybe. But most of us aren't there. Most of us are way past that. You know, and you wake up in the morning, you wake up. I woke up in the middle of the night last night. And I guarantee you, I wasn't seeing visions of angels and, 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 and joy bubbles. I, I immediately, dark thoughts and things I haven't taken care of and things I'm behind on. And, and I'm going, oh, dear God. <laughs> I'm laying in the middle of the night. I'm saying, Lord, help me go back to sleep. And I was having a hard time. <laughs> you know what came to my mind naturally? Oh, a pile of negative. You know what? You have to purposely go, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, the negative is real. We're not talking about ignoring reality. Okay, we're not talking about that. Real reality will be there next week. But so will God. And sometimes you just have to take a step back and go, okay. Yeah, I, I got it. I got all that. that. But what about, what about the things I believe that are true? All right, so look at Luke 12, Luke 12, verse 6. Luke 12, verse 6. The Lord Jesus is talking, and he says, Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings? Sparrows. And in other words, these, these little birds were nigh unto worthless. Okay, they, what he's talking about here, they're, they're, just, they're just worth almost nothing. Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings and not one of them is forgotten before God? But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. I want you to remember tonight and I hope that you um, you you will. This is true. I hope you'll get a hold of this. I hope you'll remind yourself of it. But. You know, the Lord has not forgotten you. I don't know where you're at on this road. I don't know, you know, how good things are, how bad things are, or, or if the good old days seem way in the background there. I'm not sure what's going on in your world, but um, there will be times and days and hours, you know, somewhere out there where um, you feel forgotten. But, um, you know, uh, what's bad is when you feel like the Lord is really uninvolved and far away. And that's an illusion. That's an illusion. But God has not forgotten you. If he, if he watches these sparrows that have no soul and they're not going to wind up in heaven or hell, they're just something that lives for a season and they just one day disappear. You don't even know where they are. They passed away somewhere. If God watches them, uh, he reminds us here, he says, you are of far more value 
than many sparrows. He has not forgotten you. I want you to look real quick with me. Go to the book of Genesis. There is joy and peace. You know, even when you're lonely, I think people that are lonely, people that, um, and you, you can be lonely sometimes in a house full of people, but there's people that live alone. Um, and, you know, um, whether your loneliness is in a group or whether it's just, you by yourself or however it pans out. Um, if you will believe this truth, we're not, we're not talking about psyching yourself up and trying to be positive. Uh, some of that is a waste of time. We're talking about believing truth. It is true that God has not forgotten you. That will be true tomorrow. That will be true a year. That will be true when you're 85 years old. If you're a believer. There will never be a day that God goes, oh man, I, forgot. I haven't thought about them in a long time. That day will never come. That day comes often for us. But that, ne that day never comes for him. Look at Genesis 8 verse 1. It's interesting. This is the, the flood is... Um, on the earth, the flood is in full swing. And look what it says. Genesis 8, verse 1. And God remembered Noah. Go to Genesis 19. Genesis 19. Genesis 19. And look at verse 29. God has just rained uh, fire down on Sodom and Gomorrah. And in Genesis 19, verse 29, And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst. You know why God, God, uh, you know who? It's not that God didn't care about Lot, but you know who God was thinking about? God was thinking about in Genesis 18, him and Abraham, and that conversation he had had. God didn't forget that conversation. And God remembered Abraham. Look at Genesis 30. Genesis 30. Genesis 30. You guys know the story of Jacob and Rachel and Leah, and, and Leah was very fertile. She was having children left and right, and uh, for a Jewish woman to be barren was a very shameful thing. It was considered a curse, and in Genesis 30, verse 22, it says, And God remembered Rachel, and God remembered Rachel. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1. First Samuel 1 verse 19. Again, another woman praying for a child. You know, it's funny in the Bible, there were, a, and there were a lot of great men and you read about the exploits of the men. And, you know, you read about kingdoms, kingdoms, kingdoms. And then you read about, here's a woman. She just wanted a baby. You know, God, God doesn't, God doesn't forget anybody. First Samuel one verse 19 and they rose up early in the morning, in the morning early, and worshiped before the Lord, and returned and came to their house to Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And the Lord remembered her. Look at Psalm 136. Psalm 136. And this is that famous chapter that talks about the Lord's mercy, and it says, His mercy endureth forever. And it says it uh, almost in every single verse of this chapter.
Look at Psalm 136, verse 23. You ever been in a low place, Christian? You know, whether whether that means low in spirits or um, or just, you know, you know, whatever kind of low it was. Look at Psalm 136, verse 23. Talking about the Lord who remembered us in our low estate. You know, there will never be a day that God has forgotten you. So next time you're all alone there at the house and you feel like the whole world's turned against you and you're forgotten. And, and you know, it's uh, that that there there may be a lot of truth to that in a human sense. You know, those days do come, but it, it will give you some peace in your heart uh, to remember that the one that really matters has never forgotten you. And the one that hung the stars and the one that holds your, your next week and your next month and your next year and all the blessings that can be bestowed, the one he has not forgotten you. Remember that. Look at Acts chapter 10. We'll see another thought that will bring you joy and peace if you believe it. Joy and peace in believing. From the God of hope. The God that wants to lift up your spirits and get you out of that hole. The God of hope. Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, Peter has just met up with Cornelius here, and in verse 34, Acts 10, verse 34, then Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Now, as he says that, he used to think, just a few verses earlier, he thought that as a Jew, he was superior to all the Gentiles. But suddenly he has come to realize that is not true. Verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. God is no respecter of persons. And we could look. I've got some verses written down here. I've got Deuteronomy 10, 17, Psalm 62, 9. There's, there's other verses where uh, the Lord just says, you know, it, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how high you are or how low you are. Um, uh, honor upholds the humble in spirit. Uh, God looks to the lowly. Uh, it doesn't matter where you're at. You know, some people, Christians, you know, we, we get these thoughts. And, um, you know, every discouraging thought comes not from the Lord. Um, and you'll get these thoughts and, and you'll think, oh, well, that worked out that way for so-and-so because he's been saved longer. Or, you know, uh, you know, so-and-so, you know, they, they get to do that because they're more talented. Or maybe God will work with this person more because they're more intelligent. Or, or this person, you know, God, God blesses the, the, the big shots more than he does us little unknown people. Hey, Though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly. It doesn't matter if you're a politician or if you're a doctor or if you're an accountant or if you're a plumber, if you're a man, if you're a woman, if you're a preacher, if you're a missionary or if you're 10 years old or whatever. It doesn't matter. God is no respecter of persons. God, God doesn't have the, all these people classified where he just helps the best or the highest. No. It's whosoever will. Draw an eye to God. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter how old you are. Doesn't matter how bad your past has been. Doesn't matter, you know, all your baggage. It doesn't matter. He just says, if you'll come and you'll look to me, I will help you. He's no respecter of persons. That'll give you joy. That'll give you peace. That'll encourage you that, hey, I, maybe I can do this. Maybe. Maybe I can't ask the Lord for this. I mean, if, if he did it for so-and-so, and he's no respect of persons, he'll do it for me. Let me give you another one. Look at Psalm 56. Psalm 56.
Psalm 56. Be merciful unto me, O God, for man would swallow me up. He, fighting daily, oppresseth me. Mine enemies, would he, he repeats it, would daily swallow me up. For they be many that fight against me, O thou most high. Now we're going to read down through this psalm. But what you need to see here, and man, this thought goes from one end of the psalms to the other. That the Lord is your defense. And the Lord is your shield. If you love him and you're trying to follow him, I mean, I, I, I didn't, I, be it wherever you're at on your journey. If you're, if you're trying to sincerely, I mean, you might have a lot to learn. You might have a lot of battles going on. You might be struggling with some things. But, you know, if you love the Lord, you're trying to move forward. You know what the Lord says? He said that. He says, I, I know what they'll do. He says, I've, I've watched this from the beginning. He said, you know, um, everybody that follows me, they have opposition. They have people that work against them. Uh, sometimes it's not even, it, it is for Christ's sake, but sometimes it's not apparently for Christ's sake. Here's what I mean by that. The devil will stir up opposition to you, but sometimes it's just somebody that's an idiot. It may not be because, oh, you know, you're winning people, Lord, and they don't like that. It may just be because they treat everybody that way and the devil tweaked their tail and now they're going to go after you. Um, it will help you if you'll remember that the Lord is your defense. You know, uh, you want to be careful. I think I think of George Antonio, you know, and and um, George is trying to do the right thing and he is really being careful and um, um, and he's very concerned. Like he's he's very concerned about <laughs> how public. He is becoming, and he is fearful about that. And um, and I don't know what your fears are tonight. I don't know. I don't know what they are. But you need to remember, and this will bring you joy and peace. See, fear. The Bible says, "Fear hath torment." You can be saved and love the Lord, but if you're living in the shadow of something, something you're afraid of. Um. The, that's tormenting. It, there is no peace if you're living in fear. And there's probably no joy either. But there is joy and peace when you understand that the Lord himself has set himself to be your defense. Okay? Um, look at it. Let's read it. Verse 3. Psalm 56, verse 3. What time I am afraid... I will trust in thee. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I put my trust. Here it is. David said, because I've done that, I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Every day they rest, rest my words. That means they twist my words. He, he, he says, this is a no-win situation. You ever been in one of those? You're doomed no matter what you say, no matter what you do. And if you haven't been there, you're going to be there. Every day, verse 5, they rest my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They gather themselves together. They hide themselves. They mark my steps when they wait for my soul. Shall they escape my iniquity? In thine anger cast down the people, O God. Thou tellest my wanderings. Put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? Now, boy, here's what David believed. And it was so. And it's true for you and me. When I cry unto thee, then shall mine enemies turn back. This I know. Why? Well, here's a thought that will give you some peace and joy. God is for me. You know what that means? He's, he's on your side. He's on your side. God is for me. Verse 10. In God will I praise his word. In the Lord will I praise his word. In God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. Thy vows are upon me, O God. I will render praises unto thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death. Will not thou deliver my feet from all? And he said, God, you, you saved my soul. He said, surely you'll take care of my steps. 
that I may walk before God in the light of the living. I want to look at one more. Look at Luke 6 and we're done. Luke 6. Maybe we'll do the rest of these in a couple weeks. You know what the Lord's desire is for you and me? He, he not only wants us to have joy and peace, but he wants us to be filled, filled with joy and peace. And he says, he says, the God of hope, he says, you know, he says, I'll do that. He said, you know why I'll do that? Because of who I am. He said, I'm the God of hope. Look at uh, Luke 6. And look at verse 22. Luke 6, verse 22. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you and when they shall separate you from their company. What, what a strange thought, blessed. I don't know if you've been hated and ostracized and uh, rejected. Uh, you don't think of, you don't go, wow, I feel blessed. But the Lord says, read, read the verse. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you and when they shall separate you from their company. And shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the son of man's sake. Rejoice ye in that day and leap. This sounds like somebody's full of joy. Leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the like manner did their fathers to the prophets. He's saying the day would come to them. He said when, you know, people will, uh, they'll see that you're following me and that you're serious about it. And he said, and when they when they pick up on that, he said, they will separate you from their company. And they will cast out your name. You know, when they, you know, maybe they'll mock you to your face. Maybe they won't mock you to your face. Maybe, maybe they'll get alone and and they'll 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 you know bring up your name and laugh and you know talk about what a fool you are and, and all that stuff. Um, remember tonight that the Lord is very well of every time you get alienated. Um, the Bible says our Lord suffered without the camp. Um, you know, the Lord is, the Lord understands that, I mean, he walked that path. Um, there's going to be times when there's going to be, sometimes it'll be just misunderstandings. Sometimes it's this, uh, it's the group mentality. I've seen it. I've seen it among preachers and thank God when, it, when, when there's, thank God there's some preachers that don't get caught up in that, but boy, there's some, they get caught right up in it. All of a sudden, you know, one, one, one big dog preacher puts an X on your forehead and all the rest of them go, yeah, there's something wrong with him. And all they're doing is chiming in with big dog number one. And they're believing everything he says. And it's a bunch of foolishness, but, um, Thank God they're not all like that, but I've, I've seen it even there. You know what God does? God watches all that. God has a special regard for his people when that occurs. Blessed are ye when it has something to do with me. He said, blessed are ye. He said, you might as well just rejoice and leap for joy. Because he said, I have watched and I have seen and great is your reward. There's a payday coming. You just stay with me. You just trust me. You just keep loving me. I won't forget you. I'll stand with you. Look at Isaiah 66 real quick. Just a couple verses and we'll be done. There is that fear of rejection. The fear of man brings the snare. And the fear of rejection is huge. With, with well, I think it is with all of us, but but um, especially, you know, when you're you're when you're facing that, maybe maybe for the first time, and you you know you you're facing that fear of rejection. And um 
And you know how it is whenever you take a step for the Lord and it will be a step of faith because that man, that step of faith, whether it's whatever, wherever you take that step, usually it's always a fearful step because it takes you out of your comfort zone into a place where you haven't been. And it puts you in a place where you're really trusting the Lord because, uh, because the way forward wasn't clear. And, um, but once you've, many of you know this, once you've taken that sort of a step, then you step into this zone where suddenly you meet the Lord there. And there's blessings there that come that you didn't see when you were back here and you were afraid. But what time I am afraid, David said, I will trust in thee. And, and when you step, now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. When you take that step, um, there's blessings. Uh, years ago, uh, it was a big deal for a lot of um, uh, preachers in, in what was called the Southern Baptist Convention. It was uh, in the early days of the 1900s, it was sort of a, this united group of Baptist preachers that got together in the South. And in the very early days, it was a good thing. But as the years went on, it, it began to um, get corrupted and uh, it just went downhill and downhill and downhill. Well, a great preacher of, of days gone by, um, a brother, I, I'm going to probably get the names wrong. I've got the, I've got the story correct, but I may have the name wrong. Bro brother Lester Roloff was one of those guys. Brother Roloff did go to a Southern Baptist university. And, uh, and man, by the time he came out of there, and then he started preaching, and and um, and he got to he got to he got to see what was really going on in that convention. And man, there was a lot of corrupt things going on. And we're talking, we're going way back here. We're probably talking in the 1950s. Can you imagine how corrupt it is today? And he was seeing a lot of corrupt things going on. But here's the problem: the guys that were linked into the Southern Baptist Convention. Um, they had their own um, salary thing. They had their own insurance thing. They had their own retirement thing. Some of these groups built retirement homes. So if you were a member of the Southern Baptist Convention, your future was secure. I mean, it didn't matter where you preached. The, your, the church wasn't paying you. The convention was paying you. And there were all sorts of benefits. And, and um, But one day, Brother Roloff came to the crossroads. And boy... It's just amazing. Everybody comes to that somewhere in your life, at least once, and sometimes more than once, you come to the crossroads and you're like, wow, I can't keep going this direction. I've got to go to the left or to the right. Brother Olaf knew he could go to the left and he could, uh, he could just, you know, close his eyes look the other way, just say, well, it's really not my business and I'm just going to preach and do, do right and I'll just let them do their thing. He could have done that. But something in his soul said, I am connected to this corrupt outfit and I am endorsing it every day I live. And he said, he said, I made that decision to leave the convention. He said, when I did, he said, I lost everything. He said, I lost my income. He said, I lost my retirement. He said, I lost everything. And he said, on top of that, you know what else I lost? He said, I lost all my friends. Because he said, when they got wind that I had left the Southern Baptist Convention, they all said, we're not having anything to do with you, man. You've lost your mind. And they just cut him off. He said, you know, he said, uh, I, I took that step. And he said, I, I believed it was the right step. I really did. And he said, it was the right step. And he said, and it wasn't long. He said, I hadn't been out of the convention long. And he said, I started getting phone calls and he said an old friend from years gone by called me and I said, I picked the phone and one of them said, Lester, is that you? He said, yeah, that's me. He said, well, this is Jack. He said, you remember me? And Lester goes, yeah, I remember you. He said, Lester, he said, I left the convention a little while back. He said, welcome to the fraternity of the free. And what he, dis what he discovered was when he took that step for God, he said he had alienated him from a whole bunch of people. And yet he stepped into a crowd that became his lifelong friends, 
And they marched in step together for Jesus Christ. Um, you're in Isaiah 66. Look at verse 5. Hear the word of the Lord, ye that tremble at his word. Now watch the wording of this verse. Your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake, said, let the Lord be glorified. You know, a bunch of, bunch of God-fearing Christian folks, you know, thought they were doing the right thing by writing you off. Now watch. They said, let the Lord be glorified, but he shall appear to your joy and they shall be ashamed. God says, uh, you know, I'm watching all this. And he said, uh, you're going to come out the other side. And he said, when you do, he said, they're going to, they're going to find that I am standing with you. Look at second Timothy one. We're about done. Second Timothy one. This is an odd verse. Second Timothy 1 15. Paul's writing to Timothy and he says, This thou knowest that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. He said, The Lord give mercy into the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. You know, he says in verse 15, he says, all they which are in Asia be turned away. And here's Paul, the great church planner. I mean, this is the guy that wrote most of your New Testament. And uh, man, God had greatly used him. And um, here he is in 2 Timothy. It's, he's at the end of his life. You get to chapter 4, and he says, he says in chapter 4, he says, I'm about to breathe my last breath. They're about to cut my head off. And he said uh, to Timothy, he said, but Timothy, he said, everybody in Asia, he said, they've, uh, they've backed away from me. Look at uh, 2 Timothy 2. Oh, I wrote the wrong reference down. Let me see here. Okay, chapter 4, verse 16. 2 Timothy 4, 16 and 17. Same book. And look what he writes as he closes the book. 2 Timothy 4, 16. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their, chain, their charge. Now notice verse 17. Notwithstanding, he said in spite of all that, the Lord stood with me. And strengthened me. You don't have to turn there, but in Psalm 27, verse 10, it says, When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. You know, the Lord has a real regard for the people that just keep walking with him, even though it's difficult, even though it's hard, even though, you know, there's there's things that come their way. And the Lord fill you with all joy and peace and believing. You know, um, you know, I don't know where you're at tonight in, in these various things, you know, but along the way, uh, there, there'll be some time somewhere in your life as you follow the Lord where you're going to cross this difficult bridge where um, it's going to seem like um, you're, uh, you're an outcast. But in every place that occurred, when it was for the Lord's sake, he said, uh, he said, I am with thee. Uh, you remember the three Hebrew children, you know, in Daniel there? Um, they've stepped out of the crowd because they wouldn't bow. And so now they're officially, they're, they're, they're out from the crowd. They're, the rest of the crowd is not going to have anything to do with them because they're, they're in big, big trouble now. They step out and they get thrown into that fiery furnace. And you remember what happens they, they bind them up, and the, some of the greatest men in Nebuchadnezzar's army take them and throw them. And, and uh, he heated the furnace seven times hotter than normal. 
And so that even the men that threw the men died as they were throwing Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fire. And the king looks down. He must have been at an elevated place where he could see. And he says, something's wrong here. And he looks and he says, Did, didn't? I, I thought there was three guys that we threw in the fire. And the guy goes, that's right. He goes, no. He goes, there's four men in that fire. And he said, the fourth looks like the son of God. You know, um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they stepped out away from the crowd. And, and guess who Guess who paid them a visit that they would never forget as long as they, it was what looked like the darkest day of their life became the brightest day of their life. The God of hope. Hope is bright. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. If you'll believe some of this stuff we talked about tonight, I mean, you really believe it in your heart. You know what it'll do? It'll, it'll give you peace and joy. God says, I will fill you if you'll believe these things. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your truth. Lord, we would all nod our heads and agree. We would all say, yes, we, we know this is true. But Lord, help us, Lord, that in those, those uh, dark hours, those negative waves that come over us, Lord, help us that we would remind ourselves of the things, Lord, that we know are true. And Lord, we'd really, we'd really just hold off and just believe it, Lord. Let us find ourselves filled with joy and peace in believing, Lord. That you're going to be with us in all this. And you will never forget us. You will never leave us alone. Lord, fill us with all joy and peace. Lord, we thank you that you are the God of hope. And Lord, when we find ourselves discouraged, Lord, help us, Lord, to remember where that's coming from. And help us, Lord, to immediately lift up our eyes and look to thee and trust thee and to believe what you said lord maybe somebody tonight they're in a place of fear and they're they're sort of wondering what they're going to do to next lord help them lord to believe you to believe you above everyone else in jesus name amen you're dismissed